Okay. This uh, to chapter 20 today, Ecosystems and Biosphere. So water for its energy flow through ecosystem. Ecosystem is a community of living things and abiotic environment. So ecosystem ecology deals with how nutrients and energy are stored, moved, and uh, between uh, moved among uh, organisms and surrounding atmosphere, soil, and water. There are three types of ecosystems, freshwater, marine, and terrestrial. Freshwater, this is the least common ecology ecosystem. It's only about 1.8% of Earth's surface. And these include things like lakes, rivers, streams, and so on. Marine ecosystem is the most common, about 75% of the surface is covered in ocean. Includes shallow ocean, coral reefs, deep ocean, and uh, planktons and krills. And phytoplankton carries out, like we said last time, about 40% of the uh, global photosynthesis. And the deep ocean bottoms, is, these are things like thermal vents. And then there's the terrestrial environment. And these are grouped into biomes and large community, which are large community defined by dominant plants and in a region with similar climates. So tropical rainforests, savannas, deserts, and so on. So tidal pool ecosystem is shown here, example. That's located in Mati Nikas Island, Maine. It's a small ecosystem. Here's an Amazon rainforest shown here. And this is a desert ecosystem, which can vary widely, like here. This is a desert here, but this is also desert here. So the ecosystems are complex with many interacting parts and that can be exposed to natural disturbances like rain and temperature changes and human caused disturbances, pollution, overfishing, deforestation, etc., are now as great as the natural ones. And the equilibrium is a dynamic state of an ecosystem that has a stable diversity despite the changes in species number. That's what it, uh, the ability of an ecosystem to remain at equilibrium despite the disturbances is called the resistance. And the speed at which ecosystem recovers after recover, recovers to or recovers the equilibrium after being disturbed is called the resilience. And ecosystem can lose its resi resilience entirely leading to destruction or irreversible alteration of the system. And food chain and food webs is how energy is moved, matter and energy both. Food chain is a linear sequence of organisms through which nutrients and energy pass through. Each organism in the chain occupies a specific trophic level or energy level. There are the producers, photosynthetic organisms, primary consumers, herbivores, secondary consumers, carnivores that eat the herbivores, and then there's the tertiary, eat other carnivores. Higher level consumers feed on the lower level, and top of the food chain is occupied by the apex uh, consumer. So here's an example of apex consumer given this environment, ecosystem, and this is Chinook, Chinook salmon, which eats slimy sculpin, which eats mollusks, which eat green algae, which produces CO2, produces sugar from CO2. One major factor that limits uh, the number of steps found in a food chain is the energy. The energy is lost at each trophic level and between trophic levels as heat. And uh, also in transfer to decomposers, decomposers produce heat. And after a few steps of trophic energy transfers, the amount of uh, energy left in the chain sometimes may not be enough to support a viable population at higher trophic levels. 
And here, here's the quite abundant producers. Here's the less abundant uh, primary consumers. Here's the secondary consumers. And there's hardly any uh, tertiary consumers. And that is shown by the energy content. Uh, and this is a problem with f using the food chain to describe an, e an ecosystem because some can feed from many trophic levels. They can also be eaten by many different trophic levels. So to account for that, food web is proposed. So food web shows interaction across trophic levels. So arrows point to the organism that eats it, the organism eaten to the organism that eats it. So for instance, here's a squirrel gets eaten by fox. So arrow goes that way. Uh, grazing food web has producers in the beginning or at the base here and herbivores and carnivores above it. There's, here are the herbivores. You know, here, here are the carnivores. And detrital food web includes the decomposers and detritivores at the base. These are things like fungi, bacteria, invertebrates. They recycle the, the uh, dead organic matter. <clears throat> So how does um, organism acquire energy in the food web? Food web shows how energy flow is directionally, uh, flow, flows directionally in, in the ecosystem, which is acquired in two ways. By one is the autotrophs, which harnesses the light photoautotrophs or chemical in chemi chemoautotrophs, uh, like in, as in thermal vents that uses hydrogen sulfide to make glucose. And then heterotropes, eat the autotropes, shrimp, squat and lobster, vent mussels seen near the vent, uh, near the hydrothermal vent, shows an example of how this energy flows directionally through the, uh, through the food web. And the consequence of such food webs is a biological magnification. Uh, um, biological magnification is the, it is the increasing concentration of toxins in organisms at each trophic level. You know, these are the fat soluble and they tend to accumulate in the fat tissue. DDT accumulates in bald eagle legs, making them fragile. Also, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, in, these are found in coolants and heavy metals like mercury, lead, cadmium also bioaccumulate. Bio so that so if a bird that bird eats a fish that with a biomagnified PCB have an order of magnitude or 10 times higher level of PCB than those in the fish. That's the uh, I the, yeah, that's the idea of biomag biomagnification. Then while uh, the energy flows through the, through the ecosystem, matter is conserved and re recycled. And we call that biogeochemical uh, cycle. And that includes recycling of inorganic matter between the living and the non-living. Non there are six common elements associated with organic molecules, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, <clears throat> phosphorus, and sulfur. And all of these are recycled. About 2.5% of uh, global water is fresh and uh, less than 1% of it is accessible to the living. The hydrosphere, the areas where water movement and storage occurs, these include rivers, lakes, oceans, groundwater, ice, vapor, and the atmosphere. Recycling of these elements is interconnected and the water is essential for that process. It leaches nitrogen, phosphorus into rivers, and the ocean is also a source of carbon. And the elements are cycled through the entire biosphere. We'll go through. Uh, we'll go through it pretty quick because uh, I don't want to spend too much effort on this stuff. So water is essential for all living processes. Greater than 
fifty percent of human body is water, and our cells are actually seventy percent water. And the most of land animals need a supply of fresh water to survive. Like I said, only ninety-seven point five percent of water is salty, and the ninety-nine percent of remaining two point five percent water, fresh water, is, is either in the ice or in the ground. So most of uh, most of the animals live off less than one percent. Less than less than one percent of fresh water. And the process that occur in cycling of water is evaporation and sublimation. Sublimation occurs at the mountain tops or over the iceberg. Ice turns to uh, gas. Condensation and pres precipitation. Condens clouds are the condensed water. Precipitation is the rain. Then surface, subsurface water flow, that's the underground water. And the surface runoff, that's the rivers, lakes, um, runoffs, and the snow melt. And then stream flows into back to the ocean, ultimately. That's the cycle. What about carbon? Carbon is the fourth most abundant element in the living system and is present in all organic molecules. There are two sub-cycles, rapid exchange and long-term exchange or long-term cycling through geological processes. In the living, autotrophs build as carbon bonds from CO2 and heterotrophs use this, uh, glucose and release CO2. In biogeochemical bio carbon cycle or long-term cycle, Use it, uh, involves using carbon reservoirs like air, water, sediments, soils, rocks, and earth interior. And the CO two in air comes also from the ocean. Some of the some of which form from calcium cal calcium carbonate or marine animal shells. This is the largest carbon reservoir on Earth in the sediments. And the fossil fuels are also uh, the decomposed remains of plants that uh, took millions of years and combined with CO2 and met methane from animal husbandry, they also increase CO2 in the uh, atmosphere greatly. Uh, what about nitrogen? Nitrogen is about 78% of the atmosphere, but they're not easy to get, in, uh, get into the living system. N2 has triple co uh, covalent bonds. So it's a very strong molecule. It enters the living system by nitrogen carbon, nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria, rhizobium in the roots of uh, legumes, and azobacter. So ammonification involves bacteria and fungi that convert the nitrogen waste into ammonia or NH4. And nitrification involves nitrifying bacteria that converts ammonia into the usable form of nitrite and then to nitrate. And nitrate is what is needed. And denitrification involves bacteria converting the nitrates back to <clears throat> and to gas. And human activities release nitrogen by burning the fossil fuels and by using fertilizers that leach into the water system. And nitrogen in the air, except N2, cause greenhouse gases or greenhouse effects and as a rain. And the nitrogen runoff from agriculture can cause eutroph eutrophication, which means, um, which leads to algal uh, bloom and overgrowth, which uh, diminishes the oxygen content. What about phosphorus? Phosphorus is needed for nucleic acids, phospholipids, calcium phosphates in the bones. So this is a limiting nutrient. It's necessary for growth. Without DNA, you can't grow. Without phospholipids, cells cannot function. And, and it not only yeah, it's in the aquatic ecosystem, and this occurs as a phosphate. And excessive nitrogen and phosphate, or phosphorus metal, both cause eutrophication eutrophication leading to dead zones where op oxygen depletes and there that leads to massive fish kills. And here's a, a global map of dead zones. And 
as you know, you would the West, East Coast is inundated with these dead zones. There's a, a Chesapeake Bay oyster reef shown here. There used to be over 200,000 acres, but now there are only 36 acres. In the 1700s, it would take a few days to filter the entire volume of the bay. But now it'll take more than a year because all the oysters have disappeared. And they're now introducing disease resistant variety of oyster to restore, restore the bay. So fertilizers, leaching runoff goes into the ocean. From the ocean, it reaches the rocks and diesel gets dissolved in the soil. And volcano can release aerosol that contain phosphates. And then that comes down as uh, terrestrial food based. And that gets dissolved in water again. What about sulfur? Sulfur is also essential for life. Cysteine has sulfur in it. Cis bridges, what are cis bridges? Those are the two, uh, uh, two cysteines covalently bond, bond, bonding, and they stabilize proteins. And this also cycles between ocean, land, and air. Sulfate is required for plants. In the air is sulfur, sulfur dioxide. And this enters air from decomposition or volcanoes or geothermal vents and fossil fuel burning. So sulfur dioxide dissolves in water and this thing makes sulfuric acid. In the book, it's shown as H2SO3. This S, it should be H2SO4. And this makes another acid rain. And the Lincoln Memorial shows a lot of damages from acid rain. Here's a uh, picture of Lassen Volcanic Park in California with smoke coming out or, or yeah, the heat and smoke coming out of geothermal vent steam. And let's talk about some biomes uh, that are present on the earth, uh, terrestrial, on the land rather, terrestrial biomes. My mouse has disappeared are based on land, while, while aquatic biomes include both ocean and freshwater biomes. There are eight major biomes distinguished by temperature and precipitation. There's the tropical forest, savanna, desert, chaparral, temperate grassland, temperate forest, boreal forest, tundra, mountains, and polar ice. Same bio uh, can occur geographically uh, in geographically distinct area, but have similar care, uh, climates. So let's brief, briefly go over what they are. Tropical forests, these are the most diverse terrestrial biome, uh, which is currently under threat by overlogging and deforestation. Temperature tends to be constant all year round, grows. Um, uh, growth of evergreens. There's, these are high net primary productivity area or rapid allows rapid plant growth. And they tend to have vertical layering of vegetation with distinct habitat for each, uh, habitats for animals within the, each layer. This scene here. Here's a savanna. It's a hot tropical grassland with scattered trees. Uh, Temperature is about uh, slightly below the uh, tropics and uh, they get sufficient annual rain. And they tend to have extensive dry season with fires and the uh, plants have an extensive roots for quick recovery. Deserts are between 15 to 30 degree lati latitude, north and south. And they occur as a result of mountain, they can also occur as a res result of uh, mountain range, rain shadows. And this is what happens in America or high pressure dry area. That's what happens in Africa. Temperatures anywhere from zero to 140 degrees 
night temperature drops so fast because there's very little water. Water is has has very high specific heat, so it retains heat a lot. Uh, it has low species uh, diversity, but very specific adaptation. Perennials in the desert have uh, deep roots, reduced leaves, succulent stems. Seeds can lay dormant for a long time. Cold deserts like Gobi, Great Basin Desert, will see snowfalls also. The chaparrales are in California, in California and Mediterranean regions. Uh, these are dominated by shrubs and have about 20 to 30 inches of rain a year. They have dry summer where plants lay dormant and plants are adapted to fire with seeds that only germinate after fires. And human habitats are uh, threatened by common fires in this biome. All the, uh, you know, fire, wildfires in California is occurring in chaperones. Um, then you have the temperate grasslands, pra basically prairie, and or Asian steppes. They, they have hot summers and very cold winters. Um, dominant plants are uh, grass, except the trees near the rivers. And the treeless state is maintained by the fires, low precipitation, and grazing by animals. Here's a North American bison grazing. Uh, dense vegetation with fertile soil that are packed with rhizomes. And temperate forests are most common biome in mid-latitude region with defined growing seasons, spring to fall. And they tend to be anywhere from negative 22 to 86 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Deciduous trees dominate the temperate forests with few evergreen conifers. Deciduous trees are the ones that lose the leaves in the fall and lay dormant uh, in the winter. So they tend to have growth rates. Then there are the boreal forests, taiga or con coniferous forests. These are things like uh, they're in 50 to 60 degrees latitude, Canada, Russia, Alaska. They have cold, dry winters, with short, cool, wet summers. Mostly evergreen conifers that retain the uh, needle leaves year round are found here. They need less energy to warm. Uh, needles de decompose slowly, so trees retain uh, nitrogen rich needles. And then there's the tundra, which is the north of subarctic uh, boreal forests, <clears throat> and or above the tree line of the mountains. They're very cold in the winter. They have short growing season with 24 hour sunlight during the day. And plants are typically low to the ground with very low uh, species diversity. Soil is in permafrost, permafrost state. Then there are the aquatic and marine biomes. Aquatic biomes are also influ by, influenced by abiotic, abiotic factors like light, temperature, flow regimes, dissolved solids. Light is also central to life in aquatic biome, which limits the depth of photosynthesis. And the water temperature also affects the growth rate and the amount of oxygen that is dissolved in it. And the flow, currents, tides, all affect nutrients, uh, food resources, and water. <clears throat> all water uh, contains dissolved solids or salts. While ocean has the constant high salt concentration, brackish water at the interface of fresh and saltwater ecosystem have very salt concentration and they have adaptations to survive in such an environment. Um, and the uh, closed drainage basin constant, tend to concentrate the salt. This is how the salt lake came to be. That's an example of closed drainage basin. Uh, marine biomes, mar ocean is categorized based on how far the light reaches. There's the uh, intertidal zone that's the closest to the land, tend to be sandy, muddy, rocky. They're extremely variable to the tides and many have adapted to being dry for a long time and then being submerged. There's the neuritic zone, 
this defotic region. This is at the edge of tidal, you know, tidal zone to about 650 feet in depth on the uh, continental shelf, shelf. This is the highest productivity and diversity area. This includes algae, bacteria, fish, shrimp, krill, or shrimp. Then there's the oceanic zone. This is the open ocean beyond the neuritic zone. There, they have abundant phytoplankton that support fish and whales. Then there's the benthic realm. Beneath the pelagic realm, covering all zones of the covering all zones of the ocean. They have very high level of nutrients. This is where the dead sink to. They have diverse uh, fungi, sponges, sea anemones, worms, sea stars, fishes, and bacteria. And then there's the abyssal zone. This is the deepest part of the ocean. It's very high pressure, no O2, but they are high in nutrients. And the thermal vents are located in this area, this zone, and they support chemosynthetic bacteria. So shown here, <clears throat> inner tidal zone, the starfish and mussels have shells to protect from being dried. Is an adaptation to living in inner tidal zone. <clears throat> uh, what about uh, coral reefs? Coral reefs, we said, were the uh, The foundation species was it? Let me pause here. Yeah, <clears throat> foundational species. So, this is this actually forms the second marine bio, and the ocean ridge is formed by the invertebrates, the coral reefs, living on the flooding, uh, flooding, flooding zone. This is one of the most diverse biomes. So, cnidarian are the ones that form the coral by secreting secreting the calcium calcium carbonate. And the but the rising CO two level actually acidifies the ocean and threatens the corals. This is why corals bleach. And then there's the here's an example of coral reef shown here. All the all these different shapes are created by cnidarian cor corals. And there's the estuaries. This is a third marine biome, and this is where the ocean meets the freshwater. Here's the ocean here, and here's a river. Is draining into the ocean, and the estuary area is here, and the brackish water is found in this area here. Uh, and this is where the offsprings of crustacean mollusks and fish begin, and the salinity fluctuation must be tolerated by uh, organisms that live in estuaries. What about freshwater biomes? We use fresh water to provide, provide drinking water, crops, sanitation, recreation, and industry. In the lakes and ponds, thermal stratification occurs that which affects the uh, living things. And the ni nitrogen and phosphorus, again, are the limiting nutrients in this biome also. This thermal stratification refers to water column or depth, uh, temperature the variation according to the depth of the water. Uh, nitrogen and ph phosphorus from fertilizers can cause algal bloom, which causes, which kills fish and plants that live in the water. Here's an example of algal bloom occurring, some green algae overgrowth. And rivers and streams move continuously from source water through their channel, and they carry varying amount of silt which affects the biomes. An example, another example of freshwater biome is the wetland. They have soil that's saturated with water and they have near continuous cover of vegetation rooted in the soil. But part of the stem and the leaves and the flowers are above the water. There's a mangrove forest here that's shown. And then there's the marshes, swamps, and bogs, mudflats, and salt marshes. Uh, okay, we'll leave it there for today.